In our last few videos, we've discussed how a country's equilibrium level of national output is determined by the level of aggregate demand and short-run aggregate supply at any given time. We examined situations in which countries had negative output gaps, otherwise known as recessionary gaps, and positive output gaps, also called inflationary gaps. You'll recall that the short run in macroeconomics is defined as the fixed wage period. It's the period of time over which, because of labor contracts and government interventions such as unemployment benefits and minimum wage laws, firms are unable to lower the wages that they pay their workers, and they're also able to hire more workers without having to raise wages. Because of wage inflexibility, in the short run, changes in the price level and the level of aggregate demand in the economy will lead to decreases in output when aggregate demand decreases, as we see in our graph on the left here, a fall in aggregate demand, also known as a negative demand shock, causes a short run decrease in the equilibrium level of output from YFE, full employment national output, to Y1, and a decrease in the equilibrium price level from PLF, the full employment price level, to PL1. This decrease in output and the price level is the result of sticky or inflexible wages in the short run. If firms could adjust the wage rates that they paid their workers as the prices of the goods that they produced fell, then they would lower wages when prices fell and continue to produce the same amount of output. If, on the other hand, there were an increase in aggregate demand in the economy, a positive demand shock, as we see in the graph on the right, in the short run, firms find it attractive to increase their output and hire more workers because wages are relatively fixed and profitable to produce more output. So output increases from our full employment level of output of YFE to our new equilibrium level of output of Y1. Additionally, there is demand pull inflation, which we defined in our last video on aggregate demand and aggregate supply shocks. As the equilibrium price level of the, in the economy goes from PLFE to PL1. So in these two graphs, we have illustrated a recessionary gap. We called this a recessionary gap and an inflationary gap. Output is beyond full employment in the graph on the right. In the short run, inflationary gaps and recessionary gaps are possible because of wage inflexibility. The fact that firms must reduce their level of employment and output when demand for their products falls because they cannot lower the wages that they pay their workers. And the fact that firms will increase their level of output and employment in the short run when demand for their products rise because they can continue to hire more workers at the same inflexible wage rate that they were paying workers at the full employment level of output. So these are our short run outcomes. Recessionary gaps and inflationary gaps are the likely outcome from demand and supply shocks in the short run due to inflexible wages. So let's now transition to the long run. What is the long run in macroeconomics? Well, the short run is defined as the fixed wage period. The long run is defined as the flexible wage period. It's the amount of time it takes for wages to fully adjust to the price level and the level of demand in the economy and other costs of production, not just the wages for workers, but also the rents for land, the interest rates for capital, and any other costs that firms face. In the long run, we assume that wages and other costs of production paid by firms are fully flexible and will adjust to whatever the price level in the economy is. For this reason, output will always return and adjust to its full employment level because during periods of deflation and falling demand of the economy, costs of production will fall and a nation's economy will return to its full employment level of output. So let's walk through the scenario here following a negative demand shock and a recessionary gap. In the short run, aggregate demand falls due to, let's say, a decrease in consumption or a decrease in investment in the economy, one of those aggregate expenditures that we introduced in our first video on aggregate demand. Following a decrease in aggregate demand, firms are unable to lower the wages that they pay their workers. The economy experiences a recession. Equilibrium national output decreases to Y1. As a result of this, there is an increase in unemployment. You could say the unemployment rate increases. In the short run, unemployed workers will begin collecting benefits from the government. They'll start looking for new jobs for which they'll expect to get paid the same wage that they were getting paid before they lost their previous jobs. But what happens after six months, after a year, after 18 months? Unemployment benefits from the government eventually run out. Workers' expectations of 
receiving the same wage that they were being paid before begin to diminish and workers will ultimately be willing to accept lower wages. And as they do, firms will find it once again attractive to hire more workers to increase their output. So we would expect to see short run aggregate supply increase as the wage rate falls. Recall that wages and other resource costs are the major determinant of the level of aggregate supply in the economy. So as the wage rate falls, aggregate supply increases. Firms once again wish to hire more workers, despite the fact that demand for their products is lower and that the prices they can sell their products for has also fallen, lower wages make it more attractive to produce output and output should begin to recover and return to the full employment level. So we now have a new full employment price level, I'll call that PL full employment one, and we have returned to our original full employment level of national output. In this way, the economy self-corrects from a demand deficient recession. Following the decrease in aggregate demand in the short run, fixed wages require firms to lay workers off. But in the long run, wages are fully flexible because the long run is defined as the flexible wage period. Reasons for flexible wages in the long run? Let's just outline some here. Unemployment benefits end, workers' expectations diminish, and basically it sounds bad, but workers become more willing to accept lower wages. In a way, workers who are unemployed become somewhat desperate and they're willing to go back to work for lower wages. As they do, an economy could, theoretically, flexible wages should lead to further deflation, falling input costs, and a recovery in output from the recessionary level of Y1 to the full employment level of YFE. So let's illustrate what happens in the long run following an inflationary gap. Over in this graph, we had our inflationary gap following an increase in aggregate demand. Let's say that maybe net exports increased or government spending increased. That could cause our aggregate demand curve to shift out, cause a short run increase in the equilibrium level of output, and a short run increase in the price level as the economy experiences demand pull inflation. In the short run, recall that wages are relatively fixed. Other input costs are fixed as well. Firms are highly incentivized to increase their output because doing so increases their profits as the price level and the demand for their output rises. But in the long run, what will happen? In the long run, wages will increase, other costs will increase. The reason for this is that labor markets are extra tight during a period of inflation. The economy's output is beyond full employment. All resource prices start to rise because of rising demand for workers, land, capital, and any other factors of production that firms require to produce the increased level of output. So as wages and other costs rise in the long run, aggregate supply is going to shift inwards until the economy returns to its full employment level. So here's our short run aggregate supply in the long run. In the long run, because of rising wages, the wage rate increases, aggregate supply will decrease, and this economy will return to its full employment level of output. So we see the economy self-correct. This is called self-correction. Inflationary gaps will be corrected in the long run as wages adjust to the level of aggregate demand and prices in the economy. So we end up with a new full employment price level and the original full employment level of national income. This model that we've been using is called the long run self-correction model. In the long run, an economy will correct itself following recessionary gaps and inflationary gaps because of flexible wages. This assumes that wages are fully flexible in the long run. The only reason, according to this theory, that negative and positive output gaps can occur in the short run is because of the inflexibility of wages. Now, this might have policy implications for government policymakers. If a government of a country experiencing a recession believes in this long-run self-correction viewpoint, then anything the government can do to make wages more flexible would help the economy recover more quickly. For example, reducing the period of time during which unemployed workers can receive benefits from the government, reducing minimum wages, reducing labor union power, Policies that promote self-correction of the economy are sometimes called supply-side policies. We're going to talk about these later in the course. Supply-side policies are any policies meant to increase aggregate supply and help an economy achieve short-run or long-run economic growth. 
All right, guys, in this video, we introduce the definition of long run in macroeconomics. This is the period of time over which wages and all other costs of production are fully flexible and will adjust to the price level in the economy. Because wages and other costs will adjust in the long run, output will always return to its full employment level in the long run. This now explains why the long run aggregate supply curve is vertical at the full employment level of output. No matter how much demand, no matter how much inflation or deflation there is in the economy, in the long run, output will always return to its full employment level because wages will always adjust to whatever the price level and the level of demand is in the economy. Here we go. One step at a time, don't be